When did we forget how to love? Did it happen suddenly? Or was it a gradual decline? When did we forget the very foundation of the gospel? For God so loved. Love is what moved God to action. Love is what held Jesus to the cross. Love is what rolled away the stone. But we, we've forgotten that part. Without love, we are simply a resounding gong, a clanging cymbal, a bunch of noise. Without love, we are nothing. Is that what people see in us? Meaningless, empty, noise? Love is supposed to be patient and kind, gentle, not angry or arrogant. Yet in our effort to stand on truth, we have forgotten the very thing these truths are based on. Love Never once did Jesus fail in this. Not in his heartbreak or his anger. Not in his joy or his betrayal. His default has always been love. Maybe it's time the church was more like Jesus. So we are starting a new series today, which I think is very important for the time that we're in and very important for the things that are going on in our life. And uh, that series is called How to Love People You Don't Agree With. Um, one more time, just so we can all take it to heart before we get into the message, how to love people you don't agree with. And I want to level set the room before we begin, which means I want to get us all on a firm foundation. Holly sang about that with the band. It was wonderful. Firm foundation is where we're going for, which means that we all need to be standing on that firm foundation together. So um, just by a show of hands, how many of you have ever disagreed with someone? Um, that's great. Okay, that's great. Okay, that's pretty. That's the whole room. Those online, you can raise up your hands too. Um, now, let me ask a different question. How many of you out there have ever had someone disagree with you? Uh, raise your hands, okay? Um, how many of you um, were very mad at the person who disagreed with you, right? Do we have some of that out there? Okay, let's go. Okay, so we're, we're working there, right? We're working into this mode where we understand that there are some things going on right now where um, we disagree with people. And we have to talk about what does Christ say about that? in the middle of our relationship, in the midst of a relationship. And uh, there's certain things right now that are kind of what I would call contentious topics. Um, you have things going on like right now, like the global pandemic. And there are sides to that conversation. I'm sure many of you have seen the different sides of that conversation about what's going on. Um, you have that going. You have social justice issues right now. There are many sides of that conversation going on. You have uh, that other thing going on. I haven't heard too much about it. Politics going on right now. Um, haven't seen too many of that. Uh, how many of you have seen some threads of comments online just in those three subjects that um, you, you've seen some, maybe some people disagreeing with each other? Have we all seen that? Okay. Your mode as a Christian and as learning about gospel is to go into those conversations bringing Christ with you and bringing grace with you. How many of you read those conversations but never comment? Yeah, there you go. That's right. Why can we not stop reading them? That's my question. Like I start and I'm like, I don't want to read. Oh, they didn't just say that. And I keep on going and going like, and all of a sudden you're in for like two hours on like three threads. You've read 348 comments and you're like, there's no way I'm going to get through this. Like there's 763 comments on this post. There's no way. And an hour later, you're like, I've read every one of them. And for some reason, this pride overwhelms you and you're like, I've done it. I've, I'm now informed. How many of you feel informed after you read? Yeah, don't be. You are not informed after reading comments on a thread. That is not going to be the information that you need. Uh, also, another raging debate right now, pumpkin spice. I mean, can we just raise that up? 
I mean, let's just be honest. Like billboards go up, like with people who love and don't love pumpkin spice. This is a real thing. There's a lot of things that are going on right now that we need to talk about. But I want to I wanna say first that I think we've all experienced it. And I actually experienced it um, in a real way through an online thread of someone who commented on something that I posted and uh, came at me, like, don't come at me. You know, like, uh, th- they had some words for me. And uh, I, I want to share with you the story so you can understand, because this still sits with me. It was from a year and a half ago. Still sits with me to this day. So here's what happened. Uh, we have two lovely dogs, two lovely dogs, and they're terrier mixes, about 18 to 20 pounds, beautiful, brown, they're gorgeous. And uh, we've had them now for about seven, eight years, and they're great. We had one to start, and that one, when that dog got out, would walk around to the front door and just sit at the front door and wait for us to open the door. It was a beautiful thing. Where's the dog? Where's the dog? We open the front. Boop, come on in. (laughs) That's great. It was that overwhelmingly great feeling like you know where your comfort is. It's in the house where it's warm. We feed you daily. Like your needs are cared for. That's great. Then we got her sister from the litter, and we picked her up a little bit later. She loved to go into the wilderness. She loved to take the wilderness run, and our dog figured out that maybe the house isn't the best thing for me. If I go run with my sister out into the wilderness, things are awesome out there. So our dogs escaped a couple times. And each time they escaped, we added a new level of security. So first it was a latch on the gate. We left that open, they escaped. So then we put on collars on them, then they escaped. And then we chip timed them and then they escaped. And then we built an interior fence in our backyard so they wouldn't be in the big yard. So we could latch that one if we forgot to latch this one. And we still left them both open. They escaped. And then I started to say, okay, I need more people around me because obviously I can't do this by myself. So I went into the community and there's this wonderful place called uh, Lost and Found Pets NWA. It's a Facebook group. Incredible resource. These are people who are super passionate about pets and animals, making sure they're loved on, cared for. And I had an older picture of my shaggy dogs, right, sitting in the grass. And I posted that picture out there and I said, hey, about the fifth time they'd run away. And I said, hey, my dogs have run away. I said, if you guys could help, I would love it. Really appreciate it. Here's where, they, here's where we live. You know, we live in near here. Here's how, when they got out, and they should be running. It not. Within 35 minutes, they had resourced, found the dogs like three neighborhoods away, right? Had gotten the phone number to me. I had, within 45 minutes, the dogs were back at home. And I was like, incredible. And then I lost them again. So here's what happens when you go to a loving community and you lose the love of that community twice in a row. So two months later, I lost them again, but I hadn't taken a new picture. So I used the same picture and I said, hey, dogs got out. Here's when they got out. Here's how they got out. And the first comment came back real quick because it's a great community. And I knew, I knew I could potentially be getting into a bad way going twice on this loving site. And it's awesome. I, I recommend it to anyone. If you ever lose your dogs, go here. It's an incredible community. First person responded to me and they said, hey, you reposted this accidentally you should delete it because I just saw this post two months ago and it's the same dog, so delete the post. And it was to the, basically the managers of the Facebook group. And I was like, hey, <laughs> what's going on? Definitely not a, re- you know, it's not a delete post. This is a repost because I lost him again. I said, so I just want to see if I can find him real quick. And they were very quick to reply. And they said, well, you must be a horrible owner and your dogs don't deserve to live with you. They deserve to live with whoever they are found by and I hope it's not you. And I was like, no, you didn't. I was like, no, you, I'm taking off the cross. You know, I was like, here we go. And I was saying, you know, how many of you have ever had that kind of visceral response to someone that's commented on something? Raise your hand, please. Be with me on this one. I know you're out there. Don't, don't shy away now. So as a pastor, I was like, oh, get these ready because it's about to go down. Here we go. And I was just about, and I had it in my head. Oh, when I find my dogs, guess what I'm going to tell them to do to you. And my dogs are the nicest dogs ever. They're not like, I can't tell them to do anything. They lay on the couch all day, right? And I was like, whoop, back away. I stopped and I took a breath and I was like, nope. I'm going to be Christian on this one. Hey, I know it's hard to lose dogs in two months. And I said, but I want to tell you that I love my dogs. I said, they're the first people to greet me when I come home and they run and they jump up and I wait all day to see them. And they sleep next to me at night and they cuddle up next to me and I'm missing them right now. And all I want them back is so my kids can hug them and they are sad and they are crying. And we didn't mean to leave the gate open, but we were getting things done yesterday and we built an interior gate because we love them so much and we want to make sure they're safe. And I said, and if you could help, that'd be awesome. And I said, just so you know, I would love to meet you and I would love to introduce you to my dogs and my family so then you could get to know us a little bit better. So let me know when you're available for coffee. Send. 
and I let it sit out there. Do you know what happened? Five minutes later, the post was deleted by the author. Think about it. It's very interesting when you use your experience and your love to say, hey, I don't, I don't want to let this issue divide us. I actually want to get closer to you. And I know we don't agree here, but I'd love for you to meet me so maybe we could talk a little bit and we could understand each other more. And what happens, that closeness in relationship leads to, hey, I have to be defensive now because when I wasn't in front of you and I couldn't see you, it was much easier for me to say the things that I didn't need you to respond to or I didn't have to address. That's how we exist now. But that's not what Scripture says. Scripture leads us in a different way to love people, especially as Christians. And I want to take a look back at the series title, How to Love People You Don't Agree With. I don't say how to love people who don't agree with you. And that's important because I believe the change begins here with you. I believe the change begins right here, right now with the people that you don't agree with and that you can be the change in. And we're going to witness that in Scripture today. So let's open up our Scripture. We're going to be in the Gospel of Luke. So we have four Gospels in the Bible in the New Testament. The New Testament kind of walks the story of Jesus Christ, and after Jesus ascends into heaven, walks the stories of the apostles after Jesus and uh, their ministry and starting the early church. So the Gospels are the story of Jesus from birth all the way to resurrection and ascension. And we're in the Gospel of Luke, so Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We're going to be in chapter 6, and this is Jesus' second sermon. Jesus' second sermon, and it's to the disciples and a group that is gathered there, and he's talking about the blessed are. Blessed are you who are hungry. Blessed are you who weep. Blessed are you who, when people hate you, and when they exclude you and revile you and defame you on account of the Son of Man, blessed are you. What? So we're going to talk about this a little bit. But before we do that, we love Bibles in the church. So if you've got your Bible, raise it up. We love Bibles. Raise it up. That's great. Bring a Bible to church. If you've got a smartphone, raise that up. That's great. If you're on a smartphone, download the Bible app. You can do this online too if you're watching with us. You can download the Bible app and search for the neighborhood church, and you're going to find an event that has our scripture. It has inspirational images. It has devotions on there. It has links back to our website and previous messages, and you can save that event and take notes on everything that's happening today for all of the scripture that we have. And I have special prompts in there, as if you go through the message, you can answer questions there that I posted about the content for today's message. Truly incredible. But we love that everyone has a Bible, so on the count of three, that's our vision that everyone bring a Bible to church. We want everyone to shout, bring a Bible to church. One, two, three. Bring a Bible to church. That's great. Now let's open up to the Gospel of Luke, chapter six, and we're going to start in verse 31 and read through verse 37. And here's what it says. Do to others as you would have them do to you. That's a rough start. (laughs) Starting this message series, listen to that one more time. Do to others as you would have them do to you. Oh, and then it gets harder. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those that do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. If you lend to those from whom you hope to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much again. But love your enemies, do good, and lend, expecting nothing in return. Your reward will be great. And you will be children of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. He is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. And 37, do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Here ends the gospel. And let's jump back in. I want to start at verse 32. It says, if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? And I thought, you know, that's really difficult because the way I want to start this message is by saying loving people is difficult. And I don't think we can get past that. I think we want loving people to be easy, but I can tell you right now, loving people is difficult. And I don't want you to think any different from scripture because they're not giving you any credit for loving lovely people who love you back. (laughs) That's, they're not giving you credit for that. It's not there. If you work real hard to love people who already love you, What credit is that to you? But let's talk about that. How many of you find it easy to love people who love you? 
Well, all your hands are half raised. I know what's going on right now. Like you, the, before it was here with pumpkin spice, and now you guys are like, mm, uh, it's, yeah, my, my significant other lovely one is here right now. So I'm half raised. I'm half raised. Of course, this works out great. I'm going to own it for all of us. It is hard to love people that love you. It is a constant work. It is a constant work. I want you to think about when I said, hey, in this message, we're going to talk about people right, who you don't agree with. How many of you thought of an enemy? Right, an actual, like someone who's really mean, someone who's come at you before, someone who's said things about you, someone who's treated you wrongly, and you went to this enemy mind. And yet where scripture starts is with the people that we love. And it just goes right past that, but I'm going to bring us back. I think loving people who love you is difficult because we want to agree on everything. And if you get past that beginning stage where you could do no wrong, do you remember that lovely stage when you first met? Like, you could do nothing wrong. You are a perfect human being made in the eyes of God. An angel just fell out of heaven and sprouted wings, and it was you, right? And you have this wonderful moment that sits there, and then you get married, and you're like, wait, why why did you ask me that? What did? You're not talking like you used to. What What do you mean? I have to do more? What? I don't it was great before. What, I, okay, I got to act differently and I got to do Oh, and you think that? You never told me you think that about that? Well, you never asked. Why do you mean I never asked? We've talked about how many of those have had those conversations throughout your relationships. It's important, right? When we look at this relationship, I want to tell you something about love. If love means that you have to agree, it means that your love is conditional. Hear it again. If love means that you have to agree with one another, it means that your love is conditional. How many got into the relationships that you're in, even our relationship with God, and said, I want this to be an unconditional love? I want to love you for who you are in the way that you are that God has made you. If you put agreeing with one another as a condition on your love, you're not living into this word, which then causes us to think a lot, doesn't it? A lot about what's going on, because then we come to statements in our relationships, because we're holding on. If we go back into scripture, it says, okay, so it's not credit to us, but then we get down and it says, but love your enemies, do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. So now we're called to loving, loving, loving people is easy, but now we have to love our enemies and expect nothing in return, nothing at all. So then we come up with lovely statements that sound like this. Hey, let's just agree to disagree. Let's just put a pin in that one. We'll act like we never talked about it. We're going to go back to routine and wonderfulness in our relationship so we don't have to address this thing over here because it's not secure for us. And I don't know what it's going to do. You know where that agree to disagree statement came from? The church. It came from the church. It came from the Methodist church at its early start. So you had John Wesley, who started this wonderful movement of Methodists, and we're full communion partners right? Lutheran and Methodist, which means we have a very similar theology. It means I could go over there and I could serve communion in a Methodist church as a pastor in the Lutheran church. And so what happened is John Wesley started and he raised up George Whitefield to lead over in England as Wesley was coming over the United States to evangelize and carry that movement forward. But George Whitefield liked to preach outdoors, that heresy. (laughs) What? And they started some contention between the two. And then there was things about like the doctrine of predestination and then the doctrine of sovereign grace and they started babbling. And then as they battled, it became public. And it became public and they started planting churches for their different denominations and Methodists across the street from one another because they wanted to compete for the people and communities. Is that the nature of the church? See, we're here to love on one another. But agreeing doesn't mean it has to be set as a condition on our love. And they went through all their life that way. And as they got on in years, it was said that they began to pray with one another over their relationship. They began to pray for hours, and it said that they would weep together, praying that their relationship would be resolved, that it would all come to fullness. And they didn't resolve the issues of that relationship. But right before George Whitefield died, he came to Wesley and said, would you do my eulogy? Would you do the sermon at my funeral? And Wesley said he would. And at that funeral, for his friend and their long-lasting contentious relationship, he said, here lies before me George Whitefield. 
And throughout our lives, we agreed to disagree on many different things. But the relationship with God is something that we always had together. He continued forward. And that's where that statement comes from, 1770. There's a couple earlier references of it, but that's one of the strongest, one of the first known written references of it. Agree to disagree is hard for me, though, because I, assume, I believe that we should agree to a conversation that lasts forever, and that's based on relationship. And here's why I believe that. Because if we look to our relationship with God as the foundation, that firm foundation for how we step into relationship with others who do not agree with us, what God said to us is, hey, I have the beginning, and I have the promise of the end, and I've sent my son for your sins, which means the times that you were broken, you denied me, you betrayed me, you didn't talk about me, you argued with me, you spoke about me behind my back, all those times that I know about you, all those times that you sinned, I still sent my son for you, I still have this relationship with you, because what God is saying is the relationship is more important than the issues that exist. So what do we do as a people? We don't agree to disagree. We agree that the relationship that we have to one another in Christ Jesus is more important than the topic or issue that seeks to divide us. Every time. Now, I want you to go back for a second, and I want you to think about that. If you think about your enemies again, those people who disagree with you, are they disagreeing on the relationship that you have with them or an issue that you have or a topic? Here's what I believe. If you want to be in relationship with people, you have to set that relationship and make it secure. And it sounds like this. Hey, I love you. I want my kindness to be known to you, just like Christ did to me. And I want to tell you that this relationship that I have with you is the most important thing to me. And I won't let anything come in the way of that. But I would love to talk about this. But I want to let you know it's not going to change anything about our relationship. And we could talk about this for the rest of our life, but I'd love to hear what your background is and your experience of that is, and I'll share mine. Do you hear the difference? What you've secured for that person is relationship. And you've said it's not going to change who we are together. Now let's talk about an issue that we have, but the relationship is more important. What we tend to do is we tend to make the issue most important and the other person at fault, not ourselves. That's why we have enemies. We've made them enemies. We could think about our love or that enemy. Let me hear how this switches in Scripture. I want to read a couple of Scripture selections for you, and I want you to hear the switch in these. So I want you to turn to Romans. It's after the Gospels, Acts and then Romans. And this is Romans chapter 2, verse 4. And listen to what it says, and this is the righteous judgment of God. And verse 4 says this, Or do you despise the riches of his kindness, God's kindness, and forbearance and patience? Do you not realize that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? Do you not realize that your kindness is meant to lead other people to change? Not your judgment. Or do you despise the riches of his kindness? When you make it on other people, you're saying that your kindness cannot affect change in that relationship, but your judgment will. Hey, if I judge this and I stand strong here and I put my foot down, are you going to change? If I become an immovable force, even though faith is supposed to be something that changes and moves and is called and we shift with the Spirit and God is guiding us and sending us forward, if I put my foot down here and stop the work of the Spirit, will you change? That's not how it works. It begins here in our heart. Now listen as it goes on. This is 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 8. And it says this, Above all, maintain constant love for one another, for love covers a multitude of sins. But when you're looking at the other person, it doesn't say that love covers a multitude of sins. Hey, if I'm looking at you, I believe that love reveals a multitude of sins. I believe because I love you, I can call you out on this, and I'm going to reveal your sins not only to you, but also to the world. And yet it has nothing about us sharing our kindness and our story, and our compassion with those around us. Now listen to what happens, and this is all the way back in Proverbs in the Old Testament. And this is right after Psalms, it's Proverbs 18, verse 2. It says, a fool takes no pleasure in understanding, but only in expressing personal opinion. That's when we get prideful, isn't it? 
expressing our personal opinion. I've researched it. I know everything about this topic there is to know, and I'm going to put my foot down, and I'm really proud that I know everything, and I'm going to tell you that I know everything. Do you know everything? How many times have you researched and felt really knowledgeable on a subject, right? Come on, raise your hands if you feel that, okay? And you're like, oh, I just got to share it. I just got to tell somebody. I got to go. And then someone crosses your path that doesn't necessarily agree with you, and you're like, oh, I'm going to tell them what I learned. I'm going to tell them everything. And instead of telling them what you learned, how about you tell them about the experience that you've had that brought you to that learning? And then listen to their story. Listen to what they have. See, that's part of the reason I got into church. So this is a church confession time. What I saw happening with the church was that the church started to draw lines and put its foot down and say, hey, you either believe and you're with us or you don't believe and you can go somewhere else. And yet I believe in every single church Anywhere in the world, if you were to poll that congregation on their theological beliefs on all the different issues, it would look like this. <laughs> it would look like one of those wavy arm mans at like the car dealerships. You know what I'm talking about? That's what it would look like on that graph. And the church forgot to have a conversation. It forgot to invite people in for a lifetime of study and celebration of a word that is moving in and through us with a God that is breathing life to us. How incredible is that? to think that we continue to have conversation 2,000 years later. It's not going to end now. I think we need to go deeper into it. So here's my hope for you. My hope as you think about people who don't agree with you is that you would have the grace and kindness and compassion and willingness to be in a lifetime of conversation with them. In the hope that God's kindness and relationship reveals a change moment, not only for them, but for you too. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Let us pray. Heavenly and gracious Father, we come before you knowing that we are meant to serve each other. And yet we find so many ways to put our foot down. We find so many ways to say, this is what I believe and nothing will ever change. And Lord, yet yeah, what you have done is you have brought all of us together and you've let your kindness guide. You've told us to love our enemies, which means that we need to humble ourselves. We need to look at enemies and rather than see them as enemies, see them as someone that Christ could love and then think, how do we do the same? So Lord, I pray for the courage to go into those relationships. I pray for the right words. And Lord, I pray for the forgiveness when the words are not spoken correctly. I pray that you would show me a way to make every relationship that I enter into and the people here in this church and those that are watching, as they enter into, I pray for you to have a way to make that relationship secure, not in themselves, but in you, that you become the firm foundation. So Lord, be with us. Walk with us into this, especially in these next couple of weeks. And we pray these things in your holy and precious name. And all God's people said, amen. amen. You guys enjoying the start of our series? So the nice part about this is the two-week mini-series. So next week, the Bible actually gives you a one, two, three, four, what to do when you have an argument with someone. It says, hey, if you argue with someone, try this. And it says, if that doesn't work, then do this. And it says, now if that doesn't work, then do this. Um, and so if you want to know, and if you're thinking about, well, he just said go into talk with all these relationships. These are contentious relationships. It hasn't worked out before. I don't know how this is going to work out, and it's not going to go well, Pastor Joe. Well, guess what? Next week, we have the fortification to say, if that doesn't go well, what's the next step for you? To humble yourself and walk back into these relationships in a lifetime of conversation filled with grace. So it's an incredible week next week. If you know people who need this series, share today with them. And if not, come next week also and bring them with you.